Can I introduce Dick Windling as one of the authors? Dick, over to you, please. Great. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, welcome, everybody. You can see our first slide is the cover of the book. It's amazing to think when we looked at it, the last edition of the streets book covering West Hampstead and this Kilburn and South Hampstead, amazingly was done 30 years ago. I can't believe it, 1992 was the last edition. Marianne and I decided we'll start again. There is so much material come out in the last 30 years, much of it online. We had to cover, as all the street books do, we've covered every street in the area, and it's taken us about five years of research to produce this. This is the second book of a pair, and we'll explain, we talked to a lot of people last year, you may have heard us last year, about this time, in fact, talking about the first book. This is the companion book, as it were, for the second one. If we now try and see, this is a rough map. I'm not going to take you through any of the detail. I just want to give you the big picture. Um, the book is completely revised. It's a new book. It's not a revision. Sorry, not a revision of the previous books. It's a rewritten version. Give you some idea where we are. On the left hand side, you should be able to see the straight line. That's the Kilburn High Road. And at the top is the Jubilee line running across from Kilburn Station, West Hampstead, and Finchley Road. And the key thing here is, going back to Kilburn High Road, the boundary between Brent and, and Camden runs right up the middle of the road. Now, we have permission from the editor, David, uh, that we should do both sides of the high road. It seemed silly to just do half of the Kilburn High Road. So we have done both sides, but that's including the Brent side, but we don't go into the side roads into Brent. So it's both sides of the Kilburn High Road, then across through what's perhaps called South Hampstead, across to Finchley Road, and we do do both sides of the Finchley Road. And then down south, we come down to the beginnings of kind of Maida Vale. So that kind of covers the area that we're looking at. And we have, as I say, put an enormous amount of detail in the books far too much detail for us to try and cover in 45 minutes tonight. So we've literally kind of cherry picked. We picked out a few interesting buildings and streets and some people that we think you'll be interested in hearing about. We're going to alternate. We're gonna go, Marianne's gonna do a few people and then hand it back to me. And then I'm gonna to back to her and we're gonna go backwards and forwards. Hopefully we'll go for about 45 minutes as usual <coughs> and then take then take questions at the end. So I'm gonna hand over straight away to Marianne and she's gonna take you in fact, to talk about this slide, which is probably the oldest photograph we've got of the area. Over to you, Marianne. Hello, good evening. I hope I last the talk. You'll probably hear that my voice isn't brilliant, but if I give out, Dick does have my notes and he'll be able to cover. It's the toll gate, um, undated. I think it's very early 1860s. Looking north, it shows the toll gate across the main road um, where uh, Kilburn High Road to the north meets Maida Vale to the south. The buildings on the right are now all under the Marriott Hotel site. One way to maintain roads at the time was to create a turnpike trust. You needed an act of parliament and the trustees drew up a list of sliding charges. Vehicles, passengers and all animals had to pay to pass through a gate. In 1819, the charge was two shillings for a six horse coach and two pennies for a horse or a mule at Kilburn. The money was used theoretically to mend the road, but it varied from trust to trust how well it was done and how often it was done. This shows the toll keeper standing at the entrance to his toll house under the clock, which reads uh, 6.40. It must be maybe Sunday morning, certainly the morning, because there's absolutely no traffic. The toll keeper may have been one James Hurton. In 1859, he was fined 20 shillings, which was a lot of money then, about 90 pounds equivalent today, for using what the court said was language of a most abusive nature towards Mr. Greenaway, who lived at Cricklewood. The court report doesn't say what the argument was about, 
but tempers could fray if a traveller thought they were being wrongly charged and they challenged the gatekeeper. <laughs> Just to recap, uh, the toll roads in London were finally abolished in 1864. Could we have the next image, Dick, please? There you go. This elegant looking man looks quite like the actor Robert Donat, who played Freeze Green in the biopic The Magic Box, which is a reference to the moving picture camera. William Freeze Green was a pioneer in the field of moving pictures, a prolific inventor and a very talented photographer. In 1885, he was living in Aldershot Road with his cousin Alfred Carter. This was off Wilston Lane before he moved to a house, number 136 Maida Vale. It's just a short distance south of where the toll gate once stood. By 1889, he'd patented his first moving picture camera. He filmed cousin Alfred and Alfred's three-year-old son at Hyde Park Corner. And when he viewed the images, he was so excited at what he saw, he rushed into the street yelling, I've got it, I've got it, his, his real eureka moment and he dragged a passing policeman into his Hoban lab to show the pictures. Commercial moving pictures were getting underway in Europe under the guidance of Edison, the Lumieres and Robert Paul, but William's contribution was largely overlooked. He, however, continued working and inventing, but his experiments were extremely expensive and he went bankrupt, I think, two or three times. In May 1921, he attended a major meeting of film distributors where he tried but failed to give a coherent speech. He slumped forward in his seat, head in hands, and died on the spot of heart failure. Partly because of the suddenness of his death and the circumstances, the fact it happened at a meeting of motion picture worthies, the industry arranged a very elaborate funeral at Highgate Cemetery. You can see images of the um, cortege um, on, on the web. And you can still see his memorial if you walk south past uh, the Swains Lane entrance. It's on the left. Can we have the next picture, Dick? Ah, this is his house, the poor maid of ale house, damaged, unloved, decayed. It lingered until 1997, when despite the blue plaque, which you can see in the photo, Com commemorating Freeze Green as a pioneer of cinematography, Camden gave permission for it to be demolished and a rather, I think, mean looking block of flats has replaced it. Can we have the next image, please? Ah, oh, yes. This is Dame Florence Cayford, another pioneer, this time a persistent campaigner for Kilburn, where she lived for around about 60 years. Locals knew her affectionately as R. Flo. She was born Florence Evelyn Bunch in 1897, spent her childhood in Kentish Town, where her father worked for the Midland Railway. She was working as a national insurance clerk in 1921, and she married John Cayford two years later. The couple lived at 26 Hempstall Road. In the 1939 census, John gave his occupation as a master engineer. She was simply described as a housewife but there is a little note to one side saying that she was a local borough councillor. In fact, she was one of six Labour candidates who gained control of the Kilburn Ward in 1937 and campaigned ever after that hard for the Tory-controlled Hampstead Council to improve living conditions there. In 1957, when the Housing Committee refused to condemn an area of rundown houses south of Netherwood Street, Florence gave a robust reply. She said, I don't know how many members of the council have visited these houses. Can you imagine a tiny sink in the corner of the stairs that has to be used by two or more families? It's all the water they've got. And there are many houses with only one lavatory for all the families to use. After several full starts, redevelopment finally got underway in, 18, in, sorry, in 1968, the year Florence was elected mayor of Camden and she laid the foundation stone for what was then called the Florence Cayford Estate. You can still see it, it's a very 60s design and it's on a wall in Palmerston Road. In spring 1970, she opened the first stage of the estate which was subsequently renamed as Webb Heath, but we don't know why. We've tried, um, nobody, all councillors then now, nobody seems to be able to know why the name was changed. The Caifords had two sons and celebrated their golden wedding anniversary in 1973. John died in 1982, Florence in 1987. Her name lives on 
on a block of flats, bizarrely, in Belsize Park near the Royal Free. But at the moment, there doesn't seem to be a memorial to her in Kilburn, and I think there should be. Could we have the next slide, Dick? This is a recently painted mural in Netherwood Street of June Barker, who lived on Webheath for about 50 years. She was apparently very pleased by the image, which was created by Australian artist Smug One. You can just see his signature at the very top uh, wall uh, in the photo. Um, June has now left the estate. I think she's gone into residential care. Over to you, Dick. Thanks, Marianne. We've now moved to Kilburn, and I would guess most of you have seen this at some point. We're at the Gaumont State Cinema. It's got a 120 foot tower modeled on supposedly the Empire State Building. It was opened on the 20th of December 1937 at a cost of 320,000 pounds. Amazingly, today that's 19 million pounds equivalent. It was a huge undertaking. It's a grade two listed now. It took two years to build and it ends inside were 4,000. 400, sorry, 4,004 seats. At the time, it was the biggest cinema in Europe. It was a massive cinema. Um, it's got beautiful inside, which have been preserved quite well. It's got black marble pillars, pink mirrors, candelabra, which is based on one apparently in Buckingham Palace. It's got a massive stage and a huge Wurlitzer organ is still there and still operating. Up in the tower was a special broadcasting room for Van Dam and his state orchestra, who broadcast regularly on the BBC. The cinema was Queen Mary's favourite, so she would come out of Buckingham Palace and drive down the Edgware Road to see films at the Kilburn State. The opening programme in 1937 had all the major stars of the time. So we have Gracie Fields, George Formby, Henry Hall, Larry Adler, and many others. Now, because of its size, the stage was used for live music right from the <coughs> beginning. So all the way through, you have major stars playing there. I mean, everybody you'd ever think of, all the American stars, Ella Fitzgerald, Miles Davis, Frank Sinatra, all people like that. I saw Buddy Holly there in the crickets in 1958. In fact, a year before he died in his plane crash. The Beatles played there twice in the 60s and the Rolling Stones have played there and many others. I mean, we could go on forever. The state stopped being a cinema in 1990 and it was switched over just to bingo. So only bingo was held there, again, in the large area inside. Eventually, in 2007, it was bought by the Rosh City Church. Rosh is a Hebrew word for spirit, and they currently own it. Um, supposedly, it's open once a month. It's actually quite difficult to find when it is open. But because it's a listed building, there's a limit to what they can do. But it isn't in very good condition on the outside. It is an unbelievably spectacular building. Lots of uh, videos have been filmed in there and so on. Here's one of the people that I saw, Jerry Lee Lewis in his amazing pose playing the piano with his foot. Um, he, he was coming over to do a series in 1958. The rank organization arranged for him to do a six week tour of Britain. The first night was at the Regal Edmonton and the second night was in Kilburn. So on the 25th of May, 1958, he played at the Kilburn State and I was there. The lights were dimmed. There he was in a shocking pink colored suit with a, a, bleak, a black ribbon tie. The noise inside was deafening. I had Irish girls behind me screaming at the tops of their voice, great balls of fire great balls of fire, which if you don't know, was his big hit at the time in 1958. But there was also another group coming of shouts coming up, which were go home cradle snatcher, go home cradle snatcher. Jerry 
continued playing and in between numbers he'd sit back on the stool as you can see him there and he'd, he'd comb his curly hair and then suddenly he'd burst out and kick the stool over and burst into another song. But the noise inside became louder and louder and louder. And suddenly halfway through the show, he just walked off. The show just stopped. He walked out in the middle and the show was abandoned halfway through. What was all this fuss about? Well, if you don't know the background, I'm gonna give you a bit of detail. What had happened was when he'd flown into Heathrow a couple of days earlier, a reporter called Ray Berry was at Heathrow to cover his arrival. And he saw a young girl and asked who she was. Myra Brown replied, I am Mrs. Lewis. Jerry said she was 15. They had married a few months earlier and were very happy. But Berry found out that Myra was Jerry's cousin, the daughter of his bass player, J.W. Brown. In fact, she was 13 years old and Jerry was 22 and they'd married in Mississippi where it was legal to get married at the age 12 as long as you had parent, parental permission. But it was Jerry's third marriage and in fact he was a bigamist because the divorce from his second wife hadn't come through. The press were merciless. They absolutely front page news on most of the tabloids certainly just attacking him. There were questions raised in the House of Commons. And in just after three shows, so there was this was the second, remember, there was a third one in London. And after that, the whole, the whole tour was abandoned. They flew back to the States where there was an enormous press contingent waiting for him to arrive in New York. And his popularity just dive bombed. He was banned from US radio shows. His live performance fees dropped from $10,000 a night dollars to just $250, astonishing. In the 60s, his career was resurrected. He continued to tour. He rose again from the ashes again and again. He first came back as a country and Western singer, and then later a miraculous rock and roll dinosaur, as people called him, who could still tear up the place and play the piano with his feet. Quite a memorable evening, I have to tell you, it really was. Now we've moved up to West Hampstead. If you don't know where we are, we've just kind of come out of West Hampstead Station and we've turned left into Broadhurst Gardens. And this is the English National Opera uh, House called Lillian Bayliss House in Broadhurst Gardens. It was their rehearsal studio for, until quite recently, in fact. But for almost 50 years previously, it was Decker Studios. We go back to the beginning of this building. Soon after it was built, it actually became West Hampstead Town Hall. Now, it's not the kind of civic town hall that you would imagine it was. It was a private town hall that you could rent if you wanted concerts or birthday parties, theatrical performances, and so on. In 1928, Crystal Lake Radios took over the building as a recording studio, and they had popular artists such as Vera Lynn, and Charles Penrose. You won't know the name, but if you're old enough, you might remember The Laughing Policeman. That was Charles Penrose. In the late 1930s, there were lots of small record companies, but the depression had hit them and almost <coughs> all of them were bought up either by Decca or their great rivals, EMI. So all the companies were bought up. Ted Lewis, who was the chairman of Decca, bought Crystal Lake in 1937, and he decided to close the Decca studios in Upper Thames Street and move all the recordings here to Broadhurst Gardens. So during their long history of 50 years, amazing amounts of records have been here, thousands and thousands. I mean, people like Billy Fury, Tom Jones, Lulu, the Moody Blues, David Bowie, and so on and so on. But the most famous story associated with this building, of course, is the Beatles. On New Year's Day 1962, the Beatles auditioned at Decca. Back in 1962, New Year's Day was not a public holiday. And what happened was Dick Rowe, the A&R manager, was away. And he left it to his assistant, Mike Smith, to organize the session. Brian Epstein, the manager, had traveled from Liverpool to London by train, but John Lennon, Paul McCartney, 
George Harrison and Pete Best, not Ringo Starr, Pete Best was the drummer. They had to drive down with the previous day with all their equipment. The weather was appalling. It was freezing, there was fog, there was snow. A journey that was meant to take four hours actually took 10 hours. They got lost and they eventually arrived at the Royal Hotel in Woburn Place around 10 o'clock at night. But being young men, what do they do? They head straight to Trafalgar Square to drink and see in the new year. The following day, they have to arrive at 11 o'clock here at the Decker Studios rather the worse for wear for late night drinking. So over the next three hours, the Beatles played 15 songs. They're mainly covers and only three original Lennon and McCartney tunes. The covers are quite odd for us listening nowadays. And you may not even know the tunes. Bessame Mucho, very famous at the time, The Sheik of Araby, Money, that's still going, Till There Was You and so on. Lennon and McCartney said later, they would have rather played more rock and roll, but Epstein had wanted them to demonstrate what they normally did at the cavern, which is quite a wide range of uh, songs. The same, this, the session went quite well and Brian took them for a meal in Finchley Road. The same afternoon at Decker, later that day, Brian Poole and the Tremolos came for their audition. Mike Smith, who'd organized both sessions, said to Dick Rowe, I'd like to sign both groups, the Beatles and Brian Poole and the Tremolo, Tremolos. But Dick Rowe said they can only take one. You choose. So Mike Smith was given the job of picking. Does he choose the Beatles or the Tremolos? He thought the Tremolos had a better audition. And in fact, they lived in Dagenham, which is much easier to get to than Liverpool at the time. And he lived actually quite close to Dagenham. So he chose the Tremolos over the Beatles. Now, although he made that decision, what you read in most books is that Dick Rowe is the man who went down in history as the man who turned down the Beatles. Now, that's actually not fair. And in fact, Andrew Oldham, the manager of the Rolling Stones, points out everyone who heard the Decker audition tapes turned them down. So Brian Epstein had gone around lots of different record companies and they all turned them down. In fact, you can hear that session if you want. If you go on YouTube and just type in Beatles Decker, Studio, Decker Audition, you'll get all 15 songs. You can actually hear them now. You should have a listen, I think, and see what you think. Most of the people who looked at it and listened to it think they don't perform particularly well and their unique talent really doesn't show. There's only three original songs and their covers aren't that good. They're just not very good. Now, as you most people uh, know, the Beatles, of course, are then signed by George Martin at the Rivals, EMI, in June 62. He wasn't impressed with the tape either. He listened to the tape and he didn't really like it. But he was struck by the freshness of the three songs composed by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And that's in a way what got them their contract with EMI and fame. So lots to talk about there. We're gonna move in fact, just to the right of this building. So we're still in Broadhurst Gardens and right on the corner is a big pub called the Railway Hotel. Now at this pub on the first floor, music was played from the 1950s at least. A lot of trad jazz was done there. But in 1961, Dick Jordan and Jeff Williams opened Kluke's Clique. This was a jazz and blues club on the first floor, running basically the whole length of that first floor, as you can see. Initially, it featured all the top British jazz musicians, modern jazz musicians, Tubby Hayes, Ronnie Scott, and so on. Then the growth of British blues started, and Dick and Jeff introduced a blues night on a Tuesday, and suddenly it just took off. You have bands, really in big bands, on their way up. Cream, Led Zeppelin, Fleetwood Mac, 10 years after, John Mayle, and so on. And we do have one guest appearance by Jimi Hendrix. 
Here's a very rare photograph, which uh, Jeff took. It's Georgie Fame at Kluge's Click. Georgie Fame was incredibly popular at Kluge's. He did lots of sessions there. And this is an old black and white shot showing him. Kluge's closed in January 1970. And then there's a gap of about eight years. And in 1978, it becomes the Moonlight Club. But the Moonlight wasn't in the same place. The Moonlight was actually at the back of the ground floor. And then it's at the punk era. So you've got people like U2 come out of Ireland for their first show outside Ireland. U2 are there, Adam and the Ants, The Specials, Madness, Joy Division, Stone Roses, and so on and so on. Upstairs, a, a second club called the Starlight Club was held, but that was nowhere near as successful as the Moonlight. And in fact, both clubs closed in 1993. So we've had a very interesting musical history here. And if you want to follow up more, Marianne and I have done a book called Decker Studios and Kluke's Clique, which we did with the History Press in 2013. So you'll get lots more details. In fact, the back of that book has got every band that ever played at Kluke's. It's really interesting. You, you can, if you're into popular music, you can have a look at that and find all sorts of bands and when they played there. Now we're moving to a couple of fascinating people. What a beautiful photograph of these very gentlemanly, elegant gentlemen, in fact, Turner Layton, who's on the left, the taller gentleman, and Clarence Johnson, who's on the right. Now they're American. They've come from America. Um, Turner Layton is a pianist, a singer, a composer. He lived in Aberdare Gardens for a long time once they come over from America. And I'll give you the story of, of what happened when they came here. But he actually stayed in Aberdare Gardens until he died, in fact, at the Royal Free in 1978. Way back in 1917 in New York, he turned, teamed up with Henry Creamer, who wrote the lyrics, and Turner Layton wrote the music. And they had some amazing songs, some you might remember, Way Down Yonder in New Orleans, After You've Gone, After You've Gone, in fact, <clears throat> became a million bestseller for Sophie Tucker in 19. So Leighton wrote the songs for stars such as Al Johnson and Eddie Cantor. In 1920, he teams up with Clarence Johnson. So Clarence Johnson is, is basically the singer and Leighton Turner Turner Layton, let's get his name right the right way. Turner Layton is the pianist, and they also sing harmony. Now, they are a big success in Harlem in New York, and in 1924, they come to London, to the Queen's Theatre, and they were an overnight sensation, partly because Edward, the Prince of Wales, raved about their performance and engaged them to play for his guests at St. James Palace. They get more and more popular, and they're now almost totally forgotten, but you should look them up because they're interesting. They made more than a thousand recordings with total record sales exceeding 10 million records. Astonishing. But something goes catastrophically wrong in the early 1930s. Clarence Johnson had an affair with a married white woman, Raymond Sandler. She was the wife of Albert Sandler, the violinist and leader of the orchestra at the Park Lane Hotel, and he sued for divorce. At this point, the newspapers get hold of it and awful racism. The public really turn against Johnson after the divorce in 1934. Leighton decides they have to dissolve the partnership and Johnson was declared bankrupt in 1936. And it's interesting when you look at the hearings, the bankruptcy hearings, it's revealed that between 1928 and 1935, they each had annual earnings of 64,000 pounds. That's 3.5 million pounds at today's prices. That's annual for those years. Johnson had frittered his money away. He did marry Raymond after the divorce and they returned to America, but his career failed and he ended up as a school caretaker. It's an incredibly tragic song, uh, story. In contrast, Turner Layton continued to work and tour, and he was very successful here in England, and he retired soon after being a guest 
on desert island discs in 1956. In fact, there's a BBC radio play in 1993 called After You've Gone, and Leighton's played by Clark Peters, and Lenny Henry took the part of Johnson. Fascinating. One more person that you might recognize. On the left, this is Jack Warner in an early role for him in a film called The Blue Lamp. Now, Jack Warner lived in at 56 Greencroft Gardens in the 30s and 40s. And this Blue Lamp film is a very interesting film if you haven't seen it. You can watch it on YouTube. It's there for free on YouTube. And what happens is Scotland Yard really helped the film producers. They gave them all the cars, the chase scenes are great. There's lots of external footage shot around the Paddington area and down the Edgware Road. And what you've got is Jack Warner, in fact, playing George Dixon for the first time. He's born as Horace John Waters in Bromley. He has a long and successful career. In fact, then the TV series, Dixon of Doc Green, ran on TV from 1955 to 1976. He was also in films like The Quatermast Experiment, The Lady Killers, Carve Her Name with Pride, and so on. He's given an OBE, and he dies in Hammersmith in 1981. Now, The Blue Lamp is also an early film for the next gentleman we're going to see, and Marianne's going to tell you all about, Dirk Bogart. <clears throat> He's very good looking, I think. Dirk Bogard was actually born Derek van den Bogard. I don't know how to pronounce the name correctly. In a nursing home in Hempstall Road in 1921. He was the eldest son of Ulrich van den Bogard, who was, I think, the first art editor of the Times. The first family home locally was on the corner of Priory Terrace, opposite St Mary's Church, where he was christened. And from 1922 to 1925, the family were at 173 Goldhurst Terrace. Bogart began acting in 1939, and at the Amersham Rep Company, he met Anthony Forward, who became his manager and lifelong companion. Bogart was called up. He served in the army during World War II. He took part in the Battle for Normandy. He returned to acting after the war and started to use the shortened name Dirk Bogart at um, Forward's suggestion. He was equally at home playing matinee idols um, such as Simon Sparrow in the Doctor in the House series, which were very popular in the 1950s and 60s. And he was equally as good playing groundbreaking roles, for example, a married barrister who is blackmailed over his friendship with a young man in the 1961 film Victim. He also starred in The Servant, and in 1971, he played a dying composer in Love with a Young Boy in Death in Venice. Bogart told reporters at the time, I can never hope to give a better performance in a better film. He wrote several volumes of his biography and six novels. He lived openly with um, Anthony Forward for many years, but was unable to say he was gay, as this was illegal for much of his career. And um, companies who'd signed him felt it might damage his career if um, he was known to be gay. Bogard was knighted in 1992, and he died in London in May 1999. Next, please. We have another famous face, don't we? Oh, yes. Uh, one of my favourites, I must admit. Um, <clears throat> Sean Connery was born Thomas Connery, uh, generally know, known as Tommy, in Edinburgh. His family weren't well off, and young Tommy started work age nine. He had morning and evening jobs after school every day of the week. He had a brief spell in the Navy. He was invalided out with, I think it was duodenal ulcers, and he started bodybuilding. And in 1953, he entered the Mr. Universe competition in London and he came third. Contemporary photos do reveal an impressive physique. He was about to return to Scotland, money running out, and he auditioned and got a job in the chorus of a travelling show of South Pacific. And it was round about this time that Tommy became Sean and he decided on a stage career. 
He rented a room for a year from his friends Lou and Mary Gardner in their flat at Bronsbury Villas. Lou described Sean at the time as a very large young man who kept working out with dumbbells. Sean enjoyed bargaining with the Kilburn traders over the price of clothes and food. He moved in 1958 across the high road to Three Wavell Mews off Ackle Road. I think it was three unrenovated rooms over a garage. A year later, he was offered a major part in Disney's Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Again, you can see that online if you want to. The Little People were leprechauns and it was Connery's first big hit. I chiefly remember the film for his very dodgy Irish accent. He kept lapsing back into Scottish. Everything, though, was about to change. Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman offered Terence Young the chance to direct Dr. No, a film based on Ian Fleming's novel of the same name. Terence put Sean forward for the main role of James Bond. Fleming's reported response on first meeting Connery was completely dismissive. He said, I'm looking for Commander James Bond, not an overgrown stuntman. But... There was stiff competition from established actors, Cary Grant, David Niven, Rex Harrison, even Roger Moore, of course, who later did take on the uh, James Bond role. But Sean landed it and signed a multi-film contract that lasted for quite a few years. His casting for James Bond was announced in November 61, and this photograph was taken soon after. He left West Hampstead for a large house in Acton a year later, along with his wife, actress wife, Diane Chilento, who was expecting their baby. There is a brief postscript. An elderly friend of my mother's who lived in Ackall Road tripped and fell in the street near her home. She was helped to her feet by a tall, good looking young man with a strong Scottish accent. He picked her up, took her shopping home, even offered to make her a cup of tea no prizes for guessing who it was. She too had her eureka moment. She stood up and yelled, it's him, in a hugely crowded cinema when she went to the Swiss Cottage Odeon to see Dr. No. Next, it's over to you. Thanks. Well, here we got Kim Philby. There was an interesting kind of connection here, geographically, from Wavell Mews, where Marianne's is located, uh, Sean Connery playing uh, his role there. This road where Kim Philby lived with his family is Ackle Road, and it's only about 100 yards mm -hmm. away from the other one across the roofs. Now, Kim lived here. He's the first and most important of the Cambridge spies. The Philby lived family lived here from uh, number 18, Ackle Road, from 1925 to 1950. His full name is Harold Adrian Russell Philby, and he often abbreviates it as H.A.R. Philby. He's better known as Kim, which is from the Rudyard Kipling novel of the same name. He's born in India, and that's where the kind of name catches up with him. He goes to Westminster School, and then he does his degree at Trinity College, Cambridge, in the early 30s, where he meets many of the other members of the Cambridge spy ring. After he qualified, he goes to Vienna, and here he meets Alicia Friedman. She's known as Litzi, who is an ardent communist. They married in Vienna and then returned to London in 1934. They rent a flat in West, Ham, West End Lane to be near the family home in Ackle Road. Litzi said she wanted Kim to meet a very interesting man called Otto. So in 1934, he meets Otto in Regent's Park. In fact, Otto is really Arnold Deutsch, a communist agent living in the Isaacon flats in Lawn Road, Hampstead. And he recruits Kim as a Soviet spy and asks him who else might be interested in spying for the Soviets. Now, the Cambridge spies are idealistic young men who in the 30s, See, the choice they have is supporting the Soviet Union against the spread of fascism with Hitler and Mussolini. So they, they're doing it for idealistic reasons. Kim works first as a journalist for the Times and the Daily Telegraph. And then at the outbreak of war, he joins SOE, the Special Operations Executive. In fact, then 
quite soon, in September 41, he's in a section of MI6 responsible for Russian counter espionage. That's quite ironic, really, isn't it? He's a Russian spy and he's working for MI6 in counter espionage against the Russian agents. And in September 49, he's posted to Washington as the MI6 liaison officer with the CIA. He's in such a powerful position that he's able to feed information back to Moscow, uh, really high level intelligence stuff. In 1951, his fellow Cambridge spies, Burgess and McLean, defect to Moscow when he warned them they were about to be arrested by MI5 and Special Branch. He was suspected of being the third man. However, in 1955, Foreign Secretary Harold Macmillan announced in Parliament there is no evidence that Philby has ever warned Burgess and McLean, and he wasn't a spy. Sometime later, January 63, as the net is closing in on him, Philby disappeared from Beirut, where he was working as a journalist, and he gained political asylum in Moscow. In 1988, very disillusioned, he dies as an old man in, in, at age 76. It's a quite a sad story. There's masses of stuff written currently about Philby and a lot of material has recently been released by the National Archive. So if you want more, just go online and you'll find tons. Here's a strange coincidence. This man you might recognize, Jerry Anderson. Jerry Anderson created Thunderbirds. He's born as Gerald Abrahams. And in fact, he gets his father to change the name because they were being uh, bullied and for anti-Semitic reasons, uh, and they pleaded with their father, and their mother just liked the word, uh, the name Anderson. He says, people often think I'm Scottish, but I'm not. Um, I read a biography about Jerry, and in it he said he grew up near West End Lane. So I thought, this is interesting. So I know he didn't use the internet, so I actually wrote him a letter. I said, I'm a historian. I'm interested in finding out where you lived in West, around West End Lane. Amazingly, the next evening, the phone rang and it's Jerry on the phone. And he said, I got so excited reading your letter, Dick, I had to talk to you. So I said, oh, that's really wonderful, Jerry. And I said, well, your biography, autobiography, not all, but biography says you lived somewhere near West End Lane. No, 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 no. I lived in West End Lane, he said, but I can't remember the number. I can't remember anything about which streets. I was only five. As a very young boy, the family lived on the top floor of a big house. Initially, they only had one room. So it's Jerry, his older brother, Lionel, and his parents. And in the one room, their mother hung a blanket to separate the cooking area from the sleeping area. I mean, they were that poor. His father had a job filling up cigarette machines or something strange, but they really didn't have any money. Eventually, they managed to get a slightly bigger area in the same house of three rooms and a small kitchen. And as a five-year-old, Jerry would go to Kingsgate Infant School. He'd cross over West End Lane and go down the hill to Kingsgate. Bizarrely, I went to Kingsgate much later, and my sons and daughter also went to Kingsgate. So we've got a connection directly to him. He told me he remembered after they moved, they were there from 1929 to 1935, and then they move across to Neasden. And he said he remembers hearing that during the war, the house they were in was destroyed by a doodle bug. Now I knew where the doodle bugs landed in which part of West End Lane. So I was able to go through the electoral registers until I found Abraham's at number 50 West End Lane. Now, people didn't know that before, and Jerry, of course, had forgotten, but 50 West End Lane is now destroyed. It's where the Sydney Boyd Court flats are on the corner of Woodchurch Road. It's kind of opposite the house I live in, which was damaged by the, the V1 blowing out the windows. Now, just last week, I found an amazing coincidence. The house that they lived in, that Jerry and his family lived in, number 50, is the same house that Kim Philby and Litzy lived in when they first moved back to London. It's astonishing. They're actually all together on the 
same electoral roll. Kim doesn't stay there long. He's there for about a year or so and then moves somewhere else. But it's an incredible coincidence. They both happen to be in number 50 uh, West End Lane. Jerry has a very successful career and he's, of course, most famous for the TV puppet films. He said lots of times and he even said it to me on the phone. I wanted to be a feature film director. I didn't want to make uh, puppet movies, he said, but it just became so successful and I got so much money when we did the first color one from Lou Grade that I got stuck. He had quite a sad life and there's several divorces which are very painful. And in the last years of his life, Jerry suffered from Alzheimer's and he died in Oxfordshire in, in December 2012. He was obviously suffering from Alzheimer when I, I spoke to him on the phone, but he was delightful. He was an absolutely lovely man. And he was so excited to talk about his memories of Kilburn and going down to the school. Wonderful man. Here's Walter Sickert. Uh, now this is a strange story. Sickert lived at 54 Broadhurst Gardens. That's the road we saw earlier where Decker Studios were. He lived about halfway along uh, Broadhurst going up towards Finch Road. The house has now been demolished, but he was there in, and he just married Ellen Cobden, the daughter of the radical MP Richard Cobden in 1885. They had to wait till the new house was finished and they moved in just before Christmas of that year. But it's not a happy marriage. And Ellen eventually sues for divorce in 1899, citing Walter's desertion and adultery in 1896. As you well know, I think, he moved to Mornington Crescent and formed the Camden Town Group, which met at his house. His work, particularly the studies of the music hall, has now gained considerable recognition. And a recent Camden History newsletter looks at his time in Camden Town. I think it's not the last newsletter, it's the one before that. This is one of his paintings. Uh, it's now called the Camden Town Murder. In fact, when he painted it, somewhere between 1906 and 1909, it's originally called, What Shall We Do to Pay the Rent? But Sicker later calls it the Camden Town Murder after a murder in September 1907 of Emily Dimmock, who's murdered in Camden Town. It's a very strange story, and if you want to look it up, there's lots of stuff online about it. A young artist called Robert Wood is accused and goes to the Old Bailey, where he's defended by Edward Marshall Hall, who's known as the great defender because he defended Crippin. And he manages to get Wood off. And in fact, nobody's ever been prosecuted for the Camden Town murder. So this is one of a series of about three or four paintings that later becomes grouped together as Camden Town Murders. Now, the best-selling American crime novelist, Patricia Cornwell, has claimed that Sickert committed the Jack the Ripper murders in 1888. Now, that's the time when he was living in Broadhurst Gardens. In 2002, she published Portrait of a Killer, Jack the Ripper, Case Closed. She was convinced that Sickert was the Ripper. She reportedly spent two million pounds buying his books, his desk, his, some of his paintings, trying to find DNA from the uh, paintings. And her experts then try and compare DNA believed to be Sickert's from those paintings and so on with saliva from the letters, 250 letters sent to Scotland Yard at the time of his crimes. It's not really clear whether they did or didn't find any match. I have a friend who was the uh, librarian at Scotland Yard, and he's told me that there are many more letters, many of which have been destroyed. There are only about 250 that have been kept. And of course, loads of them are faked letters by people wanting uh, publicity and so on. In 2017, she's still convinced Patricia Cornwall writes another book called Ripper, The Secret Life of Walter Sickert. She believes it's further proof of his guilt. It's largely based on the kind of paper that he used. Uh, and she feels that there's some match between his letters and some of the Ripper letters. However, 
all the reading, leading ripperologists believe she is mistaken. At the times of most of the murders, he's actually in France, but she's arguing he could get a fast cross-channel boat and rush back to Broadhurst Gardens after committing the murders and so on. It's quite an abs absurd story. Back to Marianne. Yeah, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, George Orwell was unfit for active war service and he moved from Abbey Road to the lower half of number 10, Mortimer Crescent in 1942. Orwell, whose real name is Eric Blair, was best known for his books, but he was also a journalist and a broadcaster. This was one of many Camden addresses he lived at. He loved the Kilburn House, but not everyone was as, as enthusiastic as he was. Friends made comments about a remarkably dreary, icily cold, damp flat. And Orwell had to get up every night in the middle of the night to go downstairs and stoke the boiler in the basement, otherwise it went out. He and his wife were forced to leave the flat after a V1 bomb landed across the road in June 1944. Fortunately, they were out at the time, but they returned to find the flat wreck, the ceilings had all fallen in. Orwell desperately searched through the rubble to find his manuscript of Animal Farm, which he managed to find, thank goodness, before leaving for Islington. He died at University College Hospital in London in January 1950, suffering from tuberculosis. Number 10 was demolished as part of post-World War II clearances. Um, Ed Fordham, who was a local councillor, set up a group called the Historic Kilburn Plaque Scheme, and they put up their second plaque on Kington House, which is the site of Orwell's old home. It was in, unveiled by Richard Blair, who was the couple's adopted son, and coincidentally, they'd adopted Richard while they were living in Mortimer Crescent. Next, please, Dick. Oh, this rather gentle looking man, I think, is Alan Alexander Milne, better known as A.A. A. Milne, the creator of Winnie the Pooh. Alan was the youngest of three boys. He was born in 1882 at Henley House, a school run by his father, John Vine Milne, on the south corner of what is now Mortimer Place and Kilburn Priory. Alan remembered his childhood in and around Kilburn, then still quite rural. He was fighting a boy in St Mary's Fields as the area north of Abbey Road was known before the houses were built, hunting with the family dog in the fields off the Finchley Road. The brothers regularly visited the shops on Kilburn High Road, a favourite one being one that sold ice cream. John Mill sold Henley House School in 1893. Okay, <laughs> sorry, he left Kilburn for Kent in 1893. Um, Alan went to Westminster School as a boarder and then on to Cambridge. Despite writing many successful adult books and plays, he is best known for his children's poetry and stories. Around about Christmas 1925, he was asked by the London Evening News to write a piece for them. And he decided to reprise a story, a bedtime story he'd made up for his son, Christopher Robin, about Christopher Robin's teddy bear. Alan named the bear Winnie the Pooh, and Christopher was immortalized as the young boy in the stories. Um, A.A. Milne died in 1956. The site of his birthplace in Kilburn is marked by another plaque um, erected by the historic Kilburn plaque scheme, this time on Remstead House, and it was the first one the scheme put up. It's dedicated to A.A. Milne, author and playwright, was put up in 2010. Over to you, Dick. Thanks, Marianne. This is Annie Besant. A uh, very interesting woman, and I suggest I'm not going to have time to say very much. We'll briefly look at her. Please follow her up. She is fascinating. She lived in uh, 12 Mortimer Road between 1876 and 1883. She had been married previously to the Reverend Frank Bess Bessant. He believed a wife should obey her husband. <coughs> she was a clever woman with ideas of her own. She lost her Christian faith and they moved to Lincolnshire. Frank gave her an ultimatum. He said, 
you must attend communion regularly at my church or leave. She chose to leave and she moved to South London in 1874. Here she meets Charles Bradlaugh, an atheist and president of the National Secular Society, and he gives her a job as a writer on his free-thinking newspaper, The National Reformer. She also does public speaking. She's a very beautiful woman with a wonderful voice, and she filled the halls all around the country. Bradlaugh and Annie become close friends and probably lovers, although this was never admitted. Um, her most famous thing in England is the Match Girls strike. And here's a very rare picture. She's, of course, there in the middle. That's not Bradlaugh. That's another one of the group. But here are the Match Girls all around. She wrote an article with a wonderful title called White Slavery in London. Fan fabulous title. People were really frightened of white slavery at the time. She describes the conditions of the young girls who made matches at the Bryant and May factory in Bow. They worked very long hours for just four shillings a week, and many of them were affected by phosphorus used on the match head, which gave them fossy jaw, an awful condition which rotted your jaw. She helped organize the Union of Women Match Workers. It's the first British union for women, the very first trade union. The match girls go on strike for three weeks and eventually Bryant and May agree to their terms. Annie then goes to India. She's interested in a, a religious group and she joins the Indian National Congress and in fact becomes its president in 1917 after spending three months in prison for out, her outspoken criticism of the British government. She was a real firebrand. She worked really hard for her views. She disagreed with Gandhi. Gandhi wanted passive resistance. So they're operating at the same time in India. She stays there and eventually dies in India in 1933. So I'm rushing it, but please follow her up if you don't know about her, a very, very important social reformer. Over to Marianne for our last slide. Yes, this is the last image for tonight and it's the cover shot for the book. It look, it's looking up Rowley Way on the Alexandra and Ainsworth estate. The LCC's Ainsworth estate on Boundary Road came first. It's seven low-rise blocks of flats dating from the late 1950s. The land for the Alexandra estate was bought in 1967. It was built between the Ainsworth estate and the London Overground Railway Line, replacing the houses in Alexandra Road. Part of the brief was to integrate the two developments to create what is properly known as the Alexandra and Ainsworth estate. Working under Sidney Cook, who is Camden's now celebrated borough architect, a unique design was created by another architect called Neve Brown. Building began in 1972, and the building material he chose was white, unpainted, reinforced concrete and three parallel blocks of housing run east-west. The tallest ziggurat style block, um, six and a half stories high, I think backs directly onto the railway. It faces a second four story block across Rowley Way and you can see them here. You've got the ziggurat block and the second block. This second block in turn faces the third block across Ainsworth Way. Neve conceived, pardon me, my voice is going. Neve conceived the park as the heart of the project, running from a play centre on Abbey Road right through the site to a community centre and a school. It included five playgrounds for different ages, a meadow, a woodland walk, but it became very neglected, although I believe it's been extensively restored recently. The first residents moved in to their flats in 1978 and the estate was finished the following year. The housing was listed grade two star in 1993, regarded as one of the most distinguished post-war developments and the youngest buildings ever to be listed. It's, it's a Marmite moment. You either really love the estate or you hate it. Almost from the beginning, there were problems on the estate, mainly with pipe work and heating systems. And now I think there's some of the concrete is um, crumbling but many residents have said they wouldn't live anywhere else. 
if you had the chance, um, have a look at Cook's Camden, a recent book by um, architect professor Mark, Mark Swenerton. It's expensive, but you can pick up fairly cheap copies on eBay. And it um, includes fantastic photographs of the early days of the estate, as it was the park and the playgrounds as they were, and beautiful photographs of the interiors of some of the flats, which are amazing. So that's the end for me. And over to you, Dick. Right, well, I think we should stop there, Malcolm. We've uh, slightly gone over our time, but we'll try and answer any questions that people have, and we'll do our best to cover <coughs> what people would like to know. Right, so are there any questions from the audience, please? <coughs> Can't see any signs yet. Well, uh, can I can I have a, a shot at this one? Yes. Um, is there a plan to turn this and the West Hampstead uh, book into a walking trail? Because both books would say the West Hampstead book would certainly be a lot more popular and more usable if, in fact, it followed a, a walking sequence. Um, I mean, quite frankly, when if somebody gave me the copy of the, the manuscript, I'd happily walk it out and uh, and one could you know produce something that would might be of greater interest uh, because it would be more accessible to people who just wanted to explore the area. If I can, uh, we did try that. We tried that with both books. And the brief from Camden History Society was quite straight. You can't go up and down and backwards and across roads. And the area did not lend itself to a logical series of walks without cutting back on yourself and going down a street and then back up another street. This was particularly true of this second book, um, the area of, of South Hampstead and the Alexandra Estate, that one. So we did try. Dick will bear me out. There are pages and pages on my computer of walks mm. which we eventually <laughs> abandoned and in fact yes I, I think it would be a nice idea but I think you can take the book and use it as such it, it's just slightly harder yeah we well, should I mean, just an idea for the future or you know having produced the books one could then produce a trail that follows them rather than interferes with the original publication um you see what I mean let me say, Adam, the, yeah. the books, if you haven't seen them yet, both books are one. divided into yeah. geographic areas. Yes. Um, what you need to do, there are maps which show the areas. Mm. And in the end, as Marianne said, we abandoned the <laughs> walking uh, schemes. Yes. We originally tried it and we tried different ways. It just wouldn't work. So we actually abandoned it and we've grouped them and we've allowed people, as it were, to pick the areas they want. I mean, ideally, if if it was eventually put up in an electronic form, it would be wonderful to be yes. able to click and move around and so on. But that would mean major technical things of changing the current format into an ebook. We haven't got it on ebooks at the moment, so it won't load onto tablets and phones and so on. But perhaps in the future, you are right, that there is an enormous amount to discover in both the books, but there are, it's probably, there are more, the whole area we worked out is about 200 streets between books one and two. It's a huge area and it's very twisty turny and it follows field lines and so on. So we did our best, but we can't immediately <laughs> say if you can help you. Catherine, you have a question. Yes, good evening. Um, wonderful as ever. Um, I have a question about that extraordinary cinema and what we or anybody else can do to, in, to ensure that it is better maintained, if at all possible, as a, as a listed structure. It does seem a huge pity, um, given its status, that um, it might, you know, get to such a state that where it won't survive. So, so any thoughts about that? That's a tough one, uh, Catherine. There, I think there was a group originally set up when uh, the religious group took it over, and they have had quite a difficult time with the owners of the cinema. 
But the fact it is grade two listed means there is a limit to what they can do. It was previously owned by Gala Bingo. And in fact, Gala Bingo put millions into it and actually renovated it. And it, it was in beautiful state inside. I went in it, I can't remember how many years ago, and it was pretty good still. It's the outside, I think, that is starting to crumble. But they will have to maintain it because of its listed status. So hopefully it's going to be OK. That's all I can really say. I, I can't add more, I'm afraid. All right. Are there any more questions? I can't see anyone putting their hands up. It's Beverly down there. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Please, Beverly. Hi, Dick. Nice Hi. to see you. And thank you, Catherine. Both. What a fascinating talk. Absolutely riveting. I just want to ask, as you know, why I'm interested in this most recent book, Is Kingsgate Workshops Mentioned? Oh, yes, indeed, Beverly. Oh, good. <laughs> For those I'm that don't there. know, Beverly is an artist working with about 60 other artists in Kingsgate workshops. Yes, it is well covered. Um, not in probably the detail you'd like, Beverly. Oh, but... no, you've, you've done it before. You've done the history, yeah. you know, beautifully before. Yeah, it is mentioned, of course, because, in fact, as I said, every street covered in that map area is there. And the whole history, the background, we can't go through it now, obviously, but it, the, everything about it, we know how it was built by a group of builders and then eventually becomes a, co a co cooperative, let's get the word out, a cooperative by the artists and has su survived wonderfully well. It is in the book and I can point you. I don't think you're, you're not mentioned by name, Beverly, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not famous enough, <laughs> but I shall be buying the book. And thank oh, you both thank of you, you for a fantastic talk. It was riveting, really was. Thank, thank you. The, the book is available both at uh, Camden Local Studies Library and uh, it's available by going onto the Camden History Society website and by post. But Dick, can you say which local bookshops are available? Yes. If you live in the West Hampstead area, both the two books shops in West End Lane, that's West End Lane Books and the House of Books, the newer one on the other side, both of them have both copy, uh, both books, i.e. book one and book two. The, the first book was, I didn't explain, was to the north of the Jubilee line. And the second book we just talked about is to the south of the Jubilee line. Would make a wonderful Christmas present to buy the two together a lovely set for Christmas, and they mm. are both available. Literally, it came out about 10, go, 10 days mm. ago, and they yeah. do have them available. Well, thank you very much. I, I think when a new publication comes out, it's such a delight to see so much new information that one wasn't aware of and, and so well presented. So both of you, 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 it, you couldn't have done it better. It was a really fascinating evening. Thank you Thank very you. much indeed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Um, Thank you. Meetings like this can't always work without the success and work of other people. So can I actually praise Lindsay Douglas, who organises all the technical side of this? It couldn't work so smoothly without her. And could also I praise Ruth Hayes, who has the task of ensuring we have a speaker every every month and that's a marvelous <laughs> and hard job too so thank both of them very much for that and but special thanks to us two speakers thank you very much indeed thank you thank you